Good morning, everybody. Thanks for coming out. Good to see you. Yeah, welcome to all of our locations. Everybody there, thank you. Love you all. Thanks for being here. If you're a guest, I'm Jared. Have the joy of getting to be the senior pastor of these wonderful people known as Grace Community. And it's such a joy to have you all with us today. So as you saw, we are in a series called Truth Over Trend and kind of countering the trends that are out there and seeing what the scripture has for us and how we are to live it out. So let me pray and we'll dig in. Lord, we love you. We need you. Pray for your Holy Spirit, as always, to open our hearts to the scriptures and open the scriptures to our hearts. Help our unbelief, we pray, we plead in Jesus' name, amen. amen. So you know when you see people, you, you'll ask, how are you doing? How are you? But I had a friend in seminary that every time he saw me, he would say, how's your soul? So annoying, y'all. Right? Because when you're asked that question, you got to have to pause for a moment. I mean, there's something deeper about that question where you got to do a little bit of reflection there in the moment. And I often didn't like what I saw in my own soul. So let me ask you this morning, how's your soul? I'm going to be annoying to you this morning, right? How's your soul? Well, we see here in the scriptures today, we're going to see the healthy soul. And there's also a bit of a contrast there where we're going to see a sick soul. And there are different names in this text that as you hear them, hear them with me and lay the scriptures beside your life and these names beside your name and wrestle with, do I see anything about myself in this that could be encouraging or could be really convicting? So we're in this letter called Third John. So again, remind us where we've been. John is one of the 12 disciples of Jesus. He was also one of Jesus' inner three, who were Peter, James, and John. Now he's Pastor John, and he's writing this letter to his congregation, congregations, today a young minister, and in his effort to love his people. So what's interesting is how John has written the letter John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So he wrote that letter. And then, that was a whole series, by the way, if you want to go listen to that, it's called Good to Know, did it a few months ago. Then he wrote 1 John, uh, sorry, that was the series, 1 John was the series we did. Then he wrote 2 John, that was last week. And now 3 John is this week, and this is the last time we're going to hear from him. But we see his heart, and then we see his heart for his church, and we see these personalities in the church that can encourage or convict us. So as we go into this, I want you to think along the lines of this way, that there's the trend of self-improvement, the trend of personal growth. And just let me say, I'm all about it. Listen, I read the books, I read the blog articles, I listen to podcasts all about personal growth. There's something to that. All wisdom is God's wisdom. All truth is God's truth. But what you don't hear in our society and the culture are the questions about how's your soul? And that's what we're going to get to the meat of today. So we're in this very short letter called 3 John. And instead of me just jumping right into it, I want to read the whole letter along with you. We're going to put it on the screen. My wife, Christy, asked me, wouldn't it be more helpful to kind of read the letter and everybody digest it? And I agreed. So props to my wife. All right. You can thank her for this. So let's read 3 John together. The elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in the truth. Beloved, I pray that all may go well with you and that you may be in good health as it goes well with your soul. For I rejoice greatly when the brothers came and testified to your truth as indeed you are walking in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Beloved, it is a faithful thing you do in all your efforts for these brothers, strangers as they are, who testified to your love before the church. You will do well to send them on their journey in a manner worthy of God. For they have gone out for the sake of the name, accepting nothing from the Gentiles. Therefore, we ought to support people like these, that we may be fellow workers for the truth. I have written something to the church, but Diotrephes, who likes to put himself first, does not acknowledge our authority. So if I come, I will bring up what he is doing, talking wicked nonsense against us. And not content with that, he refuses to welcome the brothers and also stops those who want to and puts them out of the church. Beloved, do not imitate evil, but imitate good. 
Whoever does good is from God, and whoever does evil has not seen God. Demetrius has received a good testimony from everyone and from the truth itself. We also add our testimony, and you know that our testimony is true. I had much to write to you, but I would rather not write with pen and ink. I hope to see you soon, and we shall talk face to face. Peace be to you. The friends greet you. Greet the friends each by name. What a letter. So what we're going to do, we're going to jump in. I'm going to, I'm going to share the text, and we're going to talk about it and apply it and take our journey together. So here we go. Third John, verse 1, to uh, the elder, to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in the truth. So the elder, John is literally elderly. He's in his 80s and 90s. But an elder is also an office of the church, which could be a pastor. So he's the pastor, and there's this young minister by the name of Gaius. He says, I love you in the truth. So John, if you've been in the Good to Know series, if you've been through these three letters, he keeps coming back to the truth, the truth, the truth, because in his day, as in our day, error from culture and otherwise creeps into the church. I mean, even more so today with TikTok and Instagram and Facebook and what's celebrated and affirmed in the culture, and then God's people start turning out of the Bible and believing those narratives, and that happened in John's day. So John, loving his people and being a good pastor and leading his pastors would always call them back to the truth, just as we try to do here. Gaius is called John's beloved. I love that. He had a special place in his heart for young Gaius. And John got that actually from Jesus because John was called the beloved disciple in terms of Jesus. Here's what struck me about John, though. Before he was known as the beloved disciple, Jesus called him a son of thunder, which most likely means he had an anger problem. <laughs> he had a bad temper. There was this moment where the Samaritans wouldn't allow the disciples to walk through their land, and James and John turned to Jesus and said, and said should we call down fire from God to burn them away? And Jesus was like, yo, John, settle down. And somehow he went from son of thunder to beloved disciple. That's the power of Christ. So if there's anything in you that holds you back and holds you down and you can't quite break free from, keep turning to Christ. Keep growing in him and his spirit will release you and free you and your soul. He goes on to say in 3 John verse 2, Beloved Gaius, I pray that all may go well with you and that you may be in good health as it goes with your soul. So there it is, the healthy soul. So first we see here that a praying soul is a healthy soul. Let me ask you, how's your soul? How's your prayer life? So in scripture, we see that prayer is our connection to God. We pray scripture and we, we're to pray in connection with the Lord. We gotta have time that we set aside in solitude to just share our hearts with him. Do you have that in your life? Do you seek that to grow that in your life? Also, we see that we pray for others. But there's this Christian trend, and I'm in this too. I'm in this with you. Where we tend to focus our prayers on people, and when we pray for them, we pray for their physical needs. We pray for their financial needs. When's the last time I or you prayed for someone's soul? That the Lord would flourish their soul. That they would be growing in truth in their soul. That they would be walking more and more closely with God in their soul. What a way to pray. So we see this connection also by John with physical health and, and the health of the soul. There's something a bit to that. The scriptures are for our physical health. You go all the way back to the Old Testament with Jethro, who was Moses' father-in-law. When Jethro sees Moses, for, hadn't seen him in a long time, literally says to him, how's your health? Hope all is going well. At the same time, I have met people who struggle in their health, but have a heart that flourishes, a soul that flourishes in Christ. It reminds me of Psalm 73, verses 25 and 26, where the psalmist says, Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is none on earth I desire but you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but the Lord is the strength of my heart, my soul, and my portion forever. I love knowing people like that. Yeah. Now think about that. There's no one I desire on earth. Can you say that? That's what struck me. Or do you say I desire no one but my kids on earth or your girlfriend or your boyfriend or your career or your marriage? No, he says there's nothing I desire on the earth in my life than you, Lord. 
And that's why he could say, my flesh, my body, my health may fail, but you are the strength of my soul. Can you say the same? But that does go against the trend of today, right? Because the trend of culture is all about the physical, all about the body image, all about the Botox and <laughs> plastic surgery and the posts on Instagram. And that's very much what it is. And again, there's something to that. But here's what the Apostle Paul says in terms of physical health. Apostle Paul says this, for physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. So key words, some value. So there is some value, but we shouldn't be like this. Came across this article this week about a tech mogul millionaire by the name of Brian Johnson. He's 45 years old. He spends $2 million per year to get an 18-year-old body. That's the, that's the title. He has a team of 30 doctors and regenerative health experts overseeing his regimen. He takes two dozen supplements and works out for an hour and drinks green juice. He constantly monitors his vital signs and undergoes monthly medical procedures. And here's the crazy one. He receives blood plasma from his 17-year-old son to put in his blood so that he can remain young. Yeah, I don't even know what to do with that. <laughs> Other than imagine if he or any of us to some degree that we put in our bodies or our physical, put that into our souls. Now watch this pivot. He has one son who gives his blood, but we have the son who gave his blood. You like that? Yeah. Named Jesus. You didn't see that coming, did you? Yeah, the son of God. And, and in him, we are, we are his. We worship him with our bodies and in a flourishing and healthy soul. So how's this soul? Do you spend more time about the physical? Do you spend more time in the gym than you do in putting time in or being with the Lord? Not putting time in, but being with him in the Lord. Here's a question I'm going to ask you. And I got everybody confused in the first service, so I'm going to read right off my notes, Okay. If your soul, if your spiritual state showed itself in your physical appearance, what would you look like? Would you have bad cholesterol? <laughs> would you uh, be out of breath? What does your soul look like? And so just as in a physical regimen, you don't eat well when you feel like it. You know, you don't work out and exercise when you feel like it. No, it's a commitment and it's consistency and that's where the growth happens. The same way for your soul because it has hope for this present life. Meaning if you're hungering for the things of God and getting into his word, that's hope for the present life that you're built and headed to eternal life. So it's, it's consistency that it's a commitment to have time with the Lord in the scriptures, yes. solitude, prayer, being here under the preaching of truth, being life on life, maybe with a small group and other Christians so that you can flourish in your souls. It's consistency where you can have this healthy soul. Third John verse three, for I rejoice greatly when the brothers came and testified to your truth as indeed you are walking in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. So there's that word, your truth. And I went, oh no, because last week I talked about there's no such thing as my truth, your truth. But what, this is where the English misses the Greek in which it was originally written. We're, really what he's writing here is saying, we rejoice greatly how you're holding on to the truth and there's no greater joy than to hear my children. It doesn't mean biological children. He's 90-year-old John. He's pastoring his people. He's saying, my congregation. I love that. My congregation, God's people. I love that you're walking in the truth. And what he's saying is he rejoices in this, that his pe Gaius and his people, they, they read their Bibles, they believe their Bibles, they live their Bibles, and they're not embarrassed by their Bibles. So when they read the Bible, they're not looking at what they can't accept. They're reading it to see what God can't accept. Amen. And he's saying, I love it when my people live in such a way. So it goes against the trend, right? The church trend and church world. The big crowds, John says, don't give me the big crowd. Give me my people walking in their Bibles. Parent trends. Just like you, I want my kids to flourish. I want them to be well. I want them to leave their mark. That's the trend. But do I pray and cheer my children on in truth and that their soul will flourish and everything go from there? How about you? John goes on in verse five. 
Beloved Gaius, it is a faithful thing you do in all your efforts for these brothers, strangers as they are, who testify to your love before the truth. You will do well to send them on their journey in a manner worthy of God, for they have gone out for the sake of the name, accepting nothing from the Gentiles. Therefore, we ought to support people like these, that we may be fellow workers for the truth. So let's break that down a bit. First of all, we see in Gaius, there are a couple of marks of where his soul is healthy. And the first one has to do with his generosity, really his financial generosity. So in those days, there were traveling evangelists who would travel to different towns and stand and preach the gospel on the, on, on the street corner, you might say. We don't really have that today, so I'm going to try to apply it more to us. But what would happen is they would come into towns and the motels and hotels, the inns, they were mostly brothels and they were filled with pests and bed bugs and so forth. And so God's people would know they were coming in town. They would invite them in their homes and they could stay for a, a very long season. They would feed them, they would help them, and then they would give them financial means by which they could carry on in their ministry. Now today we don't have that, but we do have our local church, the local church. And that a healthy soul is financially generous toward God's ministers or God's ministry, God's mission, God's church. And that's where I would ask you, how's your soul? Do you have that in your soul? And he says they do this, they preach this for the sake of the name. You always want to be a part of a church that, that exists for the sake of the name, Amen. the name of Jesus. That captures everything Jesus is, as we've seen throughout our series. He's fully God, fully man. He is without sin. He's born of the Virgin Mary. He went to the cross sinless, took on your sin and my sin and the wrath of God for what we deserve for our rebellion against God. He died third day, physically arose, then ascended to the right hand of the Father and is coming again. That's the name. And if there's a church or anybody preaching a different Jesus, they're preaching their name. So that's where you're financially generous, whether, it's, whether you're a guest here from another church or this is your church, it's for the name. And notice he says they don't, won't receive anything from the Gentiles. They won't receive anything financially from the Gentiles. Why? Well, well, Gentiles means they were unbelievers. Is it because unbelievers' money is tainted? Of course not. And if you're here as an unbeliever, I'm so thankful you're here. Keep coming back and listening to everything you hear. But they wouldn't accept it because they didn't want unbelievers to think that they were in it for the money so to speak, as if ministers can be in it for the money, which is funny. Uh, and, and they didn't want to think they were greedy and they're doing this so they could get their pockets padded a bit. Well, the way that applies to us is that, you know, here we go against the church trends of where many churches, and I'm not knocking them, it's just practices, they'll send offering plates up and down the aisle or offering baskets that will, you'll get and you'll pass it on. And there's this moment you're kind of like, oh, okay, and you get rid of it real quick. We don't do that here because we, we believe the scriptures say not to give under compulsion, but it should be a, a heart that overflows into financial generosity for his ministry, his mission, the church. And also when we have many of you who come and you're not believers, we don't ever want you to feel pressured toward financial generosity in our church. We're just so grateful you're here and that you keep coming back to hear this truth. So his soul is financially generous. That's a healthy soul. How's your soul? Secondly, he had a healthy soul because he had a, a hospitable heart. He showed hospitality as we, show, as we saw there. And scripture talks about this a lot. Hebrews 13, 2 says that you can entertain strangers who are really angels in disguise. Isn't that something? And then Romans chapter 12, verse 13 talks about how the, the Lord's people should share with each other those in need and practice hospitality. But boy, do we do this poorly? I know I do. When I was a kid, when I was a kid, eight, nine years old, and someone drove up in our driveway and knocked on the door, I was giddy. Who is it today? Somebody drive up in my driveway? Who is that? Why are they here? And then somebody knock on the door? We duck, we duck away? Did they see you? Did they see you? I don't think they saw us. You're laughing because it's you too, isn't it? Exactly. We're all a little bit that. So there's this growth that we should have. But seriously, with Gaius here, he's hospitable. Now think about that, that word hospitable. What does that sound like? Hospital, doesn't it? Hospital. There are people in this room right now and in 
our locations there in your rooms and watching online and in your neighborhood. People who are wondering right now, they may be sitting in front of you, behind you, or beside you, who are literally wondering, does anybody care if I live or die? From a student, a teenager, young adult, middle-aged, single, bad marriage, elderly, who wonder this truth. I came across a couple of articles on this. This is one that jumped out at me. A man by the name of Robert Alton was a retired bookkeeper. He died in 2017 in his flat, and he was discovered five years later. Now think about that. You know what I ask? Was there not a church where, near where he lived? Were there not Christians that lived beside him or around him? I don't know, maybe he was hard to get along with. I don't know. But was there no one interested, whether he lived or died? Did no one invite him? Did no one check on him? Did anyone leave cookies on the porch and notice three days later the cookies are still there, something might be happening? Those are the questions I ask myself, and I get to bring it to you. If anybody should have antennas up of needs around us, it should be God's people. Let us have a flourishing soul that's generous and hospitable. Yes? Now there's this abrupt change in the letter. Third John 9. I have written something to the church, but Diotrephes, who likes to put himself first, does not acknowledge our authority. So if I come, I will bring up what he's doing, talking wicked nonsense against us. So John, Gaius, leadership of the church, And not content with that, he refuses to welcome the brothers and also stops those who want to and puts them out of the church. Okay, so let's look under the rug of the church for a moment. This is where I look at this letter and I would go, I would never preach this. But that's what I I love how when we preach through books of the Bible and verses, we are forced to deal with what the text talks about. And so in this, you know, I prayed about it. I even talked with Christy about it and thought, is this going to sound self-serving or self-absorbing or whining or anything? I don't think so. And if so, just give me grace, all right? And again, this is kind of church world. And uh, think of it in terms of our pastors or pastors in general. uh, And hopefully you can pull something from it. So Diotrephes, what happened to him? We don't know. But I wonder if he came, part of Gaius' church, John's church, had a good heart, became a member, began serving, gained influence. But for some reason, he became very disgruntled with his leadership. Something went dark in his soul. So we see here, loves to put himself first. So an ego happened, pride happened. Jealousy happened. Slander happened. So perhaps there was this deep place of insecurity in his soul. And so when people behave in such a way like this, whether it's in the church or in life, I I tend to always go, man, what happened to her? What happened to him? That there's that kind of dark character and, and things starting to come out. And at the same time, I would say with you, as I look at this name, I look at myself and I go, is that in me? Is that in me anytime, anywhere? Or is it in you? Because this is a sick soul. Now, let's look at Diotrephes for a minute. He's doing this against John. Think about that. John was one of Jesus' 12 disciples, one of Jesus' inner three. He walked with the resurrected Jesus. He was beaten and imprisoned and exiled for Jesus. And Gaius is coming at him. How, I'm not Gaius, Diotrephes is coming at him. How, Diotrephes, did you get in such a place? And then there's poor Gaius. I think Gaius is beat up. I think he's beat up. I think he's discouraged. I think he's drained. And John's reaching out to him to encourage this young man. Because Diotrephes and his small group have have created this division within. Do you know, if you care or not, do you know that most pastors leave their churches because of four or five people? Not because of 40 or 50? Isn't that something? Oh, by the way, y'all, I'm fine. Can I just say that? This is, (laughs) 
I'm good. I'm, I'm fine. I'm just, I feel like I, I want to kind of help our pastors and encourage you to kind of see lives of our pastors and our leaders and also our, our elders. So what's happening here? He likes to be first. That's the poison. And that word like in the original language is phileo, which means loves. So in other words, he really likes to be first. He loves to be first, to have this preeminent name over everyone else. And so he's, he's behaving like Absalom. This is the closest I could get. So Absalom, he was David's, King David's son. Absalom is disgruntled by his father, King David. And, and King David did have some issues, as all pastors and leaders do. And Absalom was disgruntled, and so he stands at the gate where the people would come talk to King David, almost pastoring the people, David would. So then Absalom steps in and stands between King David and the people. When, when, when the people would come to see King David, he would stop them and go, you know something, I'm the one who can really help you. He's not doing it right. I do it right. He's not looking after you. I'll look after you. You can't trust him. You can trust me. And that's where it started going wrong in the kingdom, but where it's going wrong with the Diotrephes as well. It's telling people what to do, what to think, what to feel about their leaders, their pastors, and so forth, and building that little group around it. I have this theory that probably no other leader or pastor agrees with, but I have it in my soul that leaders really don't like being leaders, uh, and that a, a pastoral calling is just that. It's a calling. Uh, and that calling, that trumpet sound is what keeps pastors going, whether it's four or five people, it's a diatrophies in his group or what have you. And that's why I've told young ministers, I'm like, listen, dude, if you're going to be a pastor, don't walk up in there thinking you're going to just preach and pastor and love the people. There's a diatrophies waiting on you yeah. and that group with him. And you better know that you're called and trust the Lord with it. I think leadership in the end for pastors and leaders is open-handed take it or leave it. Take it or leave it. I think, of, I think of King David. There was this moment in King David's kingship that he was riding with his bodyguard, and they came up on a man by the name of Shimei. Shimei was disgruntled. He was angry at David, and he began to throw stones at David and curse him. And David's bodyguard looks at David, and I'm going to quote what he said to David. Let me go over there and cut off that dog's head. You got to love friends like that, right? <laughs> that want to defend you like that. David hushes him, rebukes him, and says, how do we not know that God sent him to throw stones at me and to curse me, to put me in my place? Man, that's leadership right there, y'all. It's take it or leave it. Whatever comes, God allowed it, God brought it, and I entrust him with it. If God's called me, he's going to take care of the small, the diatrophies and everybody else. That's why we don't have to defend ourselves. He threw slander and false accusations toward John and Gaius. So that means lies. It means partial truths that makes it sound like truth, but you never get the other side of the story because many don't tell theirs. This preserved dignity with the, the diatrophies even. When I came here in 2009, we had a pastor on staff by the name of Frank DeMarco. He was a retired principal pastor now, and he had a school. There was a school that named their school after him. And I thought, if someone's still alive and they named a school after him, I want to know him. I want to sit at his feet and I want to glean wisdom from this man. And he was oozing with wisdom. And here's one of the first things he told me, and I'm going to read it straight out of my notes. You ready? He said, leadership is like being on the end of a limb, and the person you least expect is sawing it off. <laughs> Be encouraged, Jared. Welcome to Grace. <laughs> All right. High five. <laughs> and you know there's something to that, and I'm sure every leader, every pastor has experienced that. So let me, how do we apply it? Don't do that. <laughs> Don't be that person there. Also, what about John? John wasn't freaking out. John wasn't panicked. John wasn't angry. He was just stating facts. So John had this calm courage, this courageous leadership. It was almost like he was saying, Gaius, I've walked with Jesus. It's all good. Let us be the same way. How do we apply this in real time? Don't be a dehotrophes. Don't be him. Call out, defend your leaders, your pastors when that kind of nonsense happens. Beware of the diatrophies 
you sense it in others. Pray, encourage your pastors, and then let's do all this together. Beware of the diatrophies in you and in me. And when he brings up his ugly head in our lives, may we repent and crucify it in our souls. Yes? All right, seven of you said yes. That's good. We can do something with that. Third John 11, beloved, do not imitate evil, but imitate good. Whoever does good is from God. Whoever does evil has not seen God. So Diotrephes had people imitating him. That was the group. And so he says to young Gaius, Gaius, don't look at Diotrephes and think, well, that, that's how you lead. No, 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 that's evil. Me first, evil. False truths, half-truths, evil. Don't lead like that, Gaius. Love, live your Bible, Preach your Bible, pastor, in lieu of your Bible, and may your leadership continue to be take it or leave it. In fact, he says, guys, here's how you do it. Verse 12, Demetrius has re received a good testimony from everyone and from the truth itself. We also add our testimony, and you know that our testimony is true. This is the way you do it. So what do we see about Demetrius? He had a good testimony, not from three references, but from everyone. He had a great reputation. From the truth itself, meaning his character, you put his life by the Bible, it matched. That he lived his Bible, he read his Bible, he believed his Bible, was not embarrassed by his Bible. Also, from the testimony of, of others that is true, meaning other leaders endorsed him to say his character is impeccable, he walks with God. And I thought, that's the person I want to imitate if you meet someone who has a great reputation in the Lord, who lives their Bible, who has a great reputation from what others close to them, leaders say around them, imitate those people, get to know those people, glean from people like that. And we have many here at Grace Community Church. Third John 13 and 15, we'll land it. I had much to write to you, but I would rather not write with pen and ink. I hope to see you soon and we will talk face to face. Peace be to you. The friends greet you. Greet the friends each by name. And that's the last we hear of John. What struck me when I first started reading this is that friends was mentioned six different times. And I thought, oh, that's the direction of the letter. And it, ended up not, it, it was not the direction of the letter. But it struck me that 90-year-old John emphasizes friends over and over and over again. So he did walk with Christ, but he emphasizes these friendships as if that's how John had calm courage. That's how he wasn't panicked or upset or even angry about what was happening because he had Christ, but he also had friends. That's where bold leadership came from, these friendships. Do you have friends in your life who know you by name? They know you to the bottom of who you are and you know them in such a way. Let me tell you why that matters. This is a quote I heard years ago as well. Because when it comes to things being said ab about you, and it could, could be in the church or the family or the neighborhood or the workplace, I learned this, that you shouldn't defend yourself because to defend yourself, your opponents don't want to hear it. And your friends don't need to hear it because they know you and they know you to the bottom of who you are. Do you have friends like that? And then finally, John says, greet the friends by name. That, 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 that moved me so much that here's John. He's the last living disciple, the last apostle who has walked with his Savior for 90 years, and he has friends that he calls out by name. Do you have those friends in your life? I want to be that friend in lives. I want to have those friends in my life, and I hope you do as well. So real quick, kind of as a finish, who were you most like in there, those names? John? Or who, who are you growing? Who did you desire to be like, right? Is it John? He walked with Christ, loves him with all his heart. He's calm and courageous in his leadership. Take it or leave it. Young Gaius, you beat up a bit in your life, your marriage, your workplace, your church. You beat up a bit. But you're looking toward the Lord through the servants of the Lord. And out of that, there's a generosity you still have in your heart, a hospitality in your heart. Are you growing in that direction? Or Demetrius, 
Demetrius had this great reputation, his character, and others spoke well of him. Do you have that? Are you growing, at least growing in that direction? Do you live your Bible? Do you read your Bible? Do you pray your Bible? Do you believe your Bible? Are you not embarrassed by your Bible? All of that in your heart. And then finally, though, Diotrephes. Every time I mentioned his name, I wanted you to go boo with me. Because he lurks in all of us. And so would you consider looking within to say, is he taking a root in my life and showing up in my life? And if so, that's a great reality to finally be aware of, that you can bring it before the Lord. And maybe go talk to your leaders if that's happening with your pastors. Go talk and work things out. Don't bury it and go dark with it. Or maybe it's just there in your marriage and workplace and friendships, and it's just something, someone who needs to be crucified. And with that said, I would ask you to join me in every day consider asking the question, how's your soul? Let's pray. Well, Lord, we love you. We need you. Thank you for this letter. As I shared with your people, I I would never choose to probably preach this letter ever or to spend time on what we spent time on today in terms of pastors and leaders. But Lord, I believe it was your will to. And I entrust this truth to your people, to people, about where we are in our hearts and our relationships. Lord, I love our pastors. Oh, I'm so grateful for everyone. What a gift. I'm so grateful for the office of our elders and what they give to your mission, your people. And I'm so grateful for your people, these precious people, your people, God's people. And how so many are seeking to walk in the truth. Have no greater joy than my children walk in the truth. Wow. And Jesus, here we cast our eyes upon you to say, we love you. We bless you. We praise you. May you be magnified. It is all about you. You are worthy. You are worth it all. It is your name that is above all names. You have the preeminent name. And we bless you. Find us in our souls healthy for your glory, for our good, for others' joy. And it's in the name of Jesus I pray. We all said? Amen. Amen.